for the Extraction Point. We've been briefed on all the important stories and events in the world of emerging information. Now, it's time to extract the data and turn it into action. Live from the SiliconANGLE studios in the heart of Silicon Valley, this is Extraction Point with John Furrier. Hi, I'm John Furrier. Welcome to my show, The Extraction Point. I'm here with Jean-Luc Chatelain, or how would you say that in France? Jean-Luc Chatelain. Chatelain, okay. Well, welcome to The Extraction Point, my show. We're going to extract out the data and find the signal from the noise. We appreciate you coming in to uh, our home here in Palo Alto, California, The Cube, um, where we discuss all the the activities going on in the marketplace, the product angle, the tech angles. Uh, but let, let's talk about uh, you and your new role at DDN. You are the Executive Vice President of Strategy and Technology at Data Direct Networks. Congratulations, that's new news. Thank you. Recently came from HP, where you were CTO of uh, a big division over there, uh, previously an entrepreneur. So tell us, uh, Jean-Luc, you're not new to DDN. I'm not. I'm not. Yeah, tell us DDN. what what's the the big move and the operating role at DDN. Well, so the big move is uh, I'm not getting any younger, but I still have the bug of a startup. <laughs> so I I, I got to do it at least one more time. Uh, I've got I've got a few one in me. Um, I had a great time at HP. Uh, you know, came through the acquisition of a former startup. Um, it's a good group of people, but again, uh, you know, having observed what's happening in the market, I could not pass up a fantastic opportunity. Um, around bringing a new way of doing information management and information extraction, and most important, insight you know, from all the data that we have to deal with today. Um, not new to DDN, I've been uh, um, a longtime friend of the founders, um, their personal friends, and I've been on the board since 2006, so I was able to see the growth of the company. And when the time was right uh, to go help them to go to the next step, yeah. Um, I signed up. So we've been talking at, at SiliconANGLE about storage being sexy. We coined that term last year. But now we're seeing at the uh, recent O'Reilly event uh, at Strata, we were doing live broadcasting. Uh, data is at the center of all the big conversations uh, around tech and the emerging opportunities. Last year was M&A with three pars of the world and Compellent. And, but storage is changing. The conversation is about big data. And there's a lot of market forces around that. You know, DDN is not a new company to the world. They are like a growing startup. You guys certainly are well beyond on the, I would call, in the garage phase, you guys have hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue, um, privately held by the founders. Um, but, but you're moving into a space that's like a startup. Um, so talk about what's going on with DDN, and then tr talk about how that relates to what you've seen in the market over the past seven to eight years that you've been involved in. Right. So D DDN is at a stage where uh, they've established their brand, uh, they've established their technology, um, they're very well known in their market space um, and, and they're really recognized by the customer as one of the foremost uh, you know, supplier in that space. In fact, little known fact, but they are the largest privately held storage company in the world. And now what we need to become is the largest information uh, company in the world, still privately held. Um, so w what's really interesting is that we are entering a new world where information is essentially going to be the currency of the global enterprise. Right? Um, I very often joke that one day we'll see a megabyte of information being quoted in Singapore. But really, it is a currency of, of, of the today's enterprise. And you know, what's, what's great is that DDN's assets are well positioned uh, to really leverage uh, the, the, the different inflection points that are happening. So let me give you the three high-level, really interesting trend and, and moments in time that maybe something we haven't seen since the client server era. Right? The, it's, it's completely changing out there. Um, we hear a lot about the information explosion, right? So back in the early 2000, there was you know, the, the, the buzz on every single analyst or every single newspaper was the information explosion. I think this was a firecracker compared to the nuclear explosion that we're going to see around information. Um, we've, a few things have happened. We've, we've given a voice to the machine. We've enabled them to uh, speak to IP. We've enabled them to be mobile. Uh, so they've risen, um, and they're very, very noisy. Uh, they have a lot to say. Right? Uh, and today, most enterprises are not ready to listen. 
I believe machine, that machine, you mean mach- Internet of Things kind of things, like mobile devices to servers, pumping out requests to applications, all of the above? Or? Uh, and, and more. Um, Coke machines. Uh, every time you put a quarter in the Coke machine, there is a GPRS transaction right, uh, around that. Um, you know, video cameras, you know, you, you can't cross the street without having some surveillance, right? Um, your meter at home, your smart meter at home is very, very verbose. So There's a lot to, to say to the energy company. And the um, infrastructure of IT today is not ready for that onslaught. Um, I believe that you know, what um, DDN has built for their no, you know, normal market, I would say their, their natural market of high performance computing and, and, and rich media and cloud um, are well suited to help the enterprise you know, swallow all that information and do something with it. The second thing is... Uh, so the first, the first is the machines, the right? The first rise of the machine, they're very verbose. They, you know, highly interactive with users and... Highly interactive with users and, you know, somebody needs to listen to them. Somebody needs to listen to them because in what all the screaming noise they're doing, there's a lot of really good information. And they're all right? connected to the internet, so it, absolutely they're okay. meter, they can be measured, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, now, that nuclear explosion of information is also forcing a convergence, and it's a convergence of store and compute. Um, Sometimes I use the word m- moving from data shipping to function shipping. There's so much data. Can you explain that? I mean, that, that, that kind of might yeah, go so over some people's heads. Yeah, shipping so data. Key, huh? Yeah, so shipping data means moving data from yeah. point to so point. Shipping data, moving data from point to point, which is what we've done for the past 50 years. Yeah, we store it to disk, move we it to the store servers. Store to disk, move it to some infrastructure for compute. That's the old and way. Then that's the old way, and then move it back to the disk along with the new result that being computed. Um, I think it was fine and dandy when we had to move a megabyte. Uh, when we have to move a gigabyte of information. But now, if in one day for a given set of video camera, I capture 10 terabyte of information and I got to do work on it, right? Sending 10 terabyte you know, from a store where the acquisition has happened all the way to the compute infrastructure to extract maybe features or people or whatever that is, yeah. it's extremely costly on all point, right? It's costly in time. It's going to take time to move 10 terabyte yeah. of data. Um, it's going to be costly in dollars because bandwidth is not free. So what's happening is we need to move the function, which is what we were doing in the compute part, inside the store, where the data is already there. Right? So you're, you're basically saying data is like bits, functions like applications or like jobs. Yeah. Right, more, yeah. more relevant packaged materi- uh, d- uh, information. Right, the processing, right? So the processing is moving close to where the data is, right? And that's gonna be very powerful because uh, we can now starting uh, we, we can now start to exploit a massive amount of data almost as soon as we receive it. Um, and, you know, I forecast in real time, you know, very soon in the next, you know, five to ten years. Um, and this at a very, very large scale. So that's the second point. You know, first point was the nuclear explosion of machine-generated data and video. Se- second point, convergence, store and compute. And the third point, which is really what's going to make a difference for the line of business, is a desire to extract result out of the inf- out of the data that you get, extract insight and transfer that insight. That's analytics, into like that's, an, like that's analytics. analytics. That's a true value of analytics, and analytics is what changes a business, right? And if you can do it uh, quickly enough, right, you can take decision in real time on on changing some aspect of your business and either capturing new customers or better retaining the one you have today, and. You know, this is not you. A lot of people are, are focusing on analytics yeah. because really that has the right you know, line of business value. It's not some geeky IT stuff. Yeah. It really transforms into new well, dollars. We, well, we're here at the home of Cloudera. It's our office we share with Cloudera, which uh, commercializes Hadoop, which is the big data kind of open source packaging uh, software. Um, and we, we were talking prior to coming on uh, the video here about a value chain where data, and you mentioned, is the currency of the future enterprise. Can you share with the folks out there the value chain that you mentioned? You had, sure. um, had mentioned something around... Um, yeah. Data, information, insight, result. Da- so data, information, insight, insight and results. Result. And context being which section there? And context is really what uh, gives meaning to data to transform it into information. Um, th- you, you could do a PhD thesis on you know, trying to define what information is, but I think the the best way uh, 
to, to put it in a synthetic manner is that information is data in context, right? And then from that data in context, you want to is extract real insight. You want to get a glimpse of what's happening. And, and that data, by the way, is extremely rich and extremely valid, uh, varied. So mm -hmm. it's not you know, just your cl classic old school transactional you know, data, but it's also all the new unstructured data and social data that's coming out. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. And so you, you, you want to extract that insight, and then from that insight, uh, you want to really produce new results in your business. So uh, machine, the, four, the, f the three key trends were machine-generated data. And video. And video, um, which is from surveillance to NR mobile, et cetera. Convergence, which is the notion of compute built right. into the storage for application-like functionality, not just storing data to disk somewhere and parking it somewhere, but actually acting on the data, right? right? More action-oriented data. And third is the analytics for the insight. Right, exactly. Um, okay, cool. So so we've explored that, and we're trying to find some proof points. And, and one company in particular that, we, that uh, we've that we had on the Cube is a company called ClickFox, and the CEO, Marco Pacelli, um, has been talking to a lot of big customers, but he, he's been telling us that a lot of the enterprises aren't there yet, and he uh, has a, uh, an analytical package that goes in and provides insight into all this massive data. And his, his primary customers are like um, uh, mobile carriers and or device, you know, yeah, Verizons and Sprints of the world. So, you know, he's going in saying, look, if you don't understand your data, you can't re-engineer your processes. So um, he's kind of bumping up and to these big clients and no one's really adopted this yet. So where, what's your opinion on where we are in that value chain for the customers out there? Are they in the just trying to figure it out stage? Is there any uh, specific examples you guys have that can share with us on, on who are the forward leaders in this area? Who's using the data for results? Right. So um, I'm familiar with ClickFox. In fact, some of their uh, VCs are our Atlanta, my hometown, although my accent is a little <laughs> west of Atlanta, <laughs> east of Atlanta. Hot Atlanta. Um, uh, it's, it's a rocking company, by the way. They, they got a great product. Uh, yeah, um, I love it. I mean, they're the yeah. ones doing a lot of cutting edge work on this insight. They, they, they are, they are. Um, you know, the, we are very early. That's the bottom line, right? Uh, they're, uh, we're at the beginning of people are trying to understand their data, and, and they're wrapping their head around it. Um, in fact, most of what you see in analytics today, and there are some exceptions, right, is really very traditionally done on the transactional data uh, that, that comes out of the operational system. Uh, and this has not yet delivered on its promises uh, because it's incomplete, because it needs to, to get not only the transactional but also the unstructured. But we are early uh, in, you know, in, in the adoption cycle. Uh, we need more proof that, that analytics is going to make a difference. But there are some segments that are um, quite advanced. Right? Uh, the financial services industry uh, you know, makes heavy use of analytics and, and does a pretty darn good job around it. Um, the uh, hospitality industry uh, is also fairly advanced uh, in using analytics to try to understand how they can better suit their product uh, to their customer base. Um, there is uh, um, the oil and gas industry are getting there. So what we're going to see, I think, is gradually as proof in the pudding are starting showing up, a lot of more traditional enterprise are going to say there, there is really true value. And to be honest, a lot of progress has to be done on the mathematical model right, mm -hmm. uh, around yeah. you know, extracting, uh, extracting that, that insight. There's some math involved. There's some <laughs> math involved. There's some math involved, right? Yeah. Uh, it's hey, not kids, easy. Kids, go, go get a PhD in mathematics. You yeah. probably will get a good job right, and yeah. in the world of analytics. Um, a lot of uh, the very basic block and tackle function that people have is they don't know yet what question to ask of their data. Right? So they have to understand what, are the, uh, you know, wh what moves their business, right? uh, what, what, what they can tweak essentially in their business to figure out what the right question is to ask. Is, that because, right is that because they just never had this kind of access to data in the past? I mean, it seems to be that people are kind of clumsy around the notion of asking questions. It kind of makes, I mean, just, you know, you ask any executive old school that's not a tech geek, you know, they have a back of the envelope kind of manage their business mentality. But now as we measure everything, it's almost like it should be that simple. They should know the basic questions. Well, is it just <laughs> they've never had the chance to do it before? Or? Um, they've done it in a very... Um, backward looking kind of view of the world. Most analytic hasn't been predictive. 
uh, most of the analytics that we see on the Fortune 500 today are reporting analytics. They look backward, right? And they look backward for two reasons. One of them is pure compliance and governance. I gotta make sure I got my reports on my you know, quarters for the numbers. Um, and, and the other one is to think that uh, just looking at the past can give you a good prediction of the future. And that's no longer true because we're in a very dynamic environment where stuff that has worked last week uh, may not work this week because of some external yeah. event. So I think they have looked at the data. I mean, people have been capturing data forever, right? Uh, the world of EDW is not about to dis disappear overnight. There are some very strong players in that. But they tend to have a backward-looking view of the world rather than a forward-looking. So what's really new Has real-time been a big part of, that, part of that, too, in terms of, like, reports tend to seem to be taking a long time to kind of... They're, they're not real-time. They're, they're completely time-shifted. Right? Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, there is an, an analogy is um, it's like using TiVo for your data, right? Uh, you're going to watch the football game three weeks after it happened because you're going to TiVo. Well, if you create reports <laughs> and it takes three weeks to get the report, you know, you're looking at what happened in your, in your game. Yeah, what good is yeah. it? Game's yeah, over. Game's, <laughs> game's over. over. <laughs> I'm going to quote you on that so, one. That's good. <laughs> so That's the, a uh, memorable you know, soundbite. It, it's, it's really not, um, it's really not uh, uh, proactive today. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it's very reactive. Uh, it's very time shifted. Uh, prediction is key, uh, and business speed, business time is going to be to be key. Can I extract my my information? You know, uh, when some event happens, so I can yeah. predict what I'm going to do in the next. Uh, so opportunity meeting. opportunity for folks out there, like the big enterprises and folks that you you guys talk to, and and for all the quite frankly, all the storage vendors have the same opportunity is. Just go out and build some massive data. I can go to S3, Amazon. I can go to Fry's next door here and get, you know, two terabytes for you know a couple bucks. Um, you guys sell some drives. I mean, it's not, they're not inexpensive, right? So, so tell us through the opportunity of what it really takes. Um, and you know, we were talking about some of the things we're doing in social media, Silicon Angle. You know, this is an ingestion problem, right? You have machines throwing off massive amounts of information. You have convergence where there's needs for all kinds of speed in real time, and obviously reporting on analytics. The three things you mentioned. I mean, how do people handle the ingestion? I mean, we've. You know, you can't just put two terabyte drives together and string them together to handle even just pulling in Twitter data or RSS data or never mind mobile data. Right. So talk through that pipe. What's that, what's that ingestion? Yeah, well, a challenge. So a, f a few points. Number one, Fry's should not only put the price of the drive uh, as an asset cost, but should put a little note next to it, which is this is how much it's really going to cost you when you add all the software <laughs> that you need to do something with. Right? <laughs> and it should be, you know, this this. One terabyte drive is ninety-nine dollars, but your real cost is going to be you know six ninety-nine, right? Yeah. So um, this is why you know the, the storage business is still a, a good business. That's why the work. cloud storage business yeah. is working pretty well, right? And, and the cloud storage unit is is helping some of that, uh, you know. Uh, but you know, let's go back to the uh, ingestion process, and and let's tie to uh, to what we really needed. Um, you need big pipes, right? So. Uh, buying a bunch of drives by themselves is pretty useless. You need to have essentially a freeway to be able to bring the information to those drives in parallel. Uh, and you know, I'm going to toot our own horn, but this is what we do at DDN. We, we build giant Highway 405 right, that, that takes massive amount of information and puts it uh, in, into large pools of storage. And I, I can say that no one does it better than us from a performance point of view. Uh, the second part is tied to the computer. I'm sure, you know, Hitachi, EMC, uh -huh. NetApp, all these guys will be like, all, oh, well, maybe not NetApp, but Hitachi. I mean, yeah. All these guys will, will challenge that, but okay. You're biased. I, I, of course I'm biased. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I know where, I know it's sending my paycheck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, but, no, but you guys do but have but a reputation, you, you yeah. do have a reputation of uh, building the meanest, highest, good, good density, you know. Yeah, very uses, high performance, high, high density performance density. drives. And that's because our customers, you know, most of our customers, uh, or a large part of our customers come from the high performance computing world where well, you, know, you can well, we, you, but let's we'll drill into that later let's stay on the ingestion be, yeah, point you can be a, a tourist so you, you need a big uh, you need a big uh, uh, a big freeway to, to get the information inside the stuff but we also need an infrastructure that can bring that computer that I talked about so your your um, device your solution your subsystem that's going to capture all that data has to be able to have uh, virtualized processing capabilities so it can you know, treat that data in real time. That's how, that's how you're able to handle 
that stuff. You can do a lot of the curation pre-processing phase by just running uh, the, the, the pre-compute algorithm right next to the metal, right, right me where you, you lay the bits. Right? And you want to be able to do that uh, you know, in-house, but you also want to do that, to be able to do that uh, in a cloud manner, meaning you want to be able to um, uh, go to, you know, some cloud infrastructure, a kind of a self-serving infrastructure, you can get that on demand. And that's, that requires some tech to do that ingestion. I mean, let's just say, take for example, Twitter data. That's a terabyte a day, fire hose, whatever it is. Yeah. That's a lot of data. Lots I mean, of data. Have put that on some space. Lots of moving parts. It's not just about moving you know, the data from point A to point B. It's you know the whole indexing uh, part of it is. You know. So you get the hardware, get the har advances in hardware. We've seen that in right. you know, Moore's law and all that great stuff uh, at the platform level. You obviously were at HP. Uh, your last company sold to HP, so you were seven years at HP as a CTO there, and so you're familiar with this information infrastructure. How much of the information infrastructure? Um, is software based, and it, will it be more software than hardware? Where's the IP going to be? Um, the IP is going to be in software, definitely. So the hardware must have a set of characteristics that enable that software, right? Um, so I'm, as much as there is commoditization of hardware, um, there is no commoditization of properly building hardware, right? Uh, so hardware is not going to be disappearing, uh, but definitely the trend's going to be to have, a, you know, an infrastructure where both compute and store live together. And then the, the whole values into software that can exploit that hardware. How can I, you know, um, extend my stack of value, you know, upwards toward the user? Because at the end of the food chain, right, from, from the bits sitting on the, mag on, on the magnetic surface uh, all the way to the user, you know, at the end, there is a user. There's a guy with yeah. a, a UI and, and a workflow that he has to follow. I'm John Furrier. We're here in the extraction point in the, talking about big data with the Cube in Palo Alto. SiliconAngle.com, SiliconAngle.tv. We're extracting all the uh, the data points out of the uh, the noise and turning it into signal. I'm here with John Luke Chatelain, uh, Executive Vice President with DDN, Data Direct, data direct Networks. Uh, your new operational role. You've been on the board since uh, 2006. Um, let's talk about big data. Big data is a big trendy word, and most people kind of think of it as a marketing term for the industry. Um, but data, you mentioned, is the currency of the future for big corporations and maybe even for users. Um, what's your definition of big data? And what's your angle on the whole data uh, market? I mean, obviously, it's important you guys are in that business, but big data in particular. Um, can I say that you guys, analysts and journalists, you're making a lot of further <laughs> on that world. Right? Uh, can we find another word? Um, I don't. I, 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 I propose lots of data. I don't. I actually don't uh, like big data. In fact, you know, GigaOM, a friend of mine, is daring an event called Big Data, which I think is a bad name. Uh, Mike Olson, the CEO of Cloudera, doesn't like the name Big Data. He was on stage at Strata saying we should get rid of that term. Uh, Tim O'Reilly actually didn't call his conference Big Data; he called it Strata Data, and he talks about data in particular. So, so you know, it's provocative. It provides a lot of uh, debate, but uh, we're not pretty high on that big data because. All data is big. Right. Um, if you're an enterprise or big service provider, you got to deal with all kinds of data, big, little, fast, slow. But in the aggregate, it's all data, right? right. It's all right. to be vetted. Uh, yeah, I think the, the difference may be the fact that um, w an aspect of big is how rich the, the data is and, and how many facets that it has that you didn't have before, right? Before, when we were limited to transaction, we kind of knew what what we're dealing with, but mm -hmm. now that we're dealing with massive amount of unstructured data, and, and that we are kind of data called data to dodo, right, which is kind of a hybrid mode of all the stuff produced yeah. by a social network, um, that probably is what defines big data, is that it's, it's big and different. Right? It's unstructured. It's highly unstructured. Uh, and, and the good point of unstructured data is there's a massive amount of value, but that value is really well hidden, right? and, uh, and all the magic is how you're going to extract you know, really that insight that of, you know, because it's not coherently pulled package when it comes in, right? right. It's like you and I were talking about this the uh, Jody uh, Foster movie Contact, where you know all this kind of data and noise is kind of uh, unstructured, and there's some signal in there, and you have to try to find that signal. Um, that seems to be a big part of what Facebook and Twitter and these social networks have have created this notion of ac activity stream, a river of information flow. The there's all these metaphors about volume, 
right. coming well, in. Can you talk about volume and kind of what all this is meaning? This whole so the volumes are large. What's interesting, uh, and that's uh, you know th this is pretty obvious. But what's interesting is that those new um, you know social type of in, uh, pieces of information um, they dangle a lot of handles. We can start grabbing. Uh, to, to start going down a road where where you know there is value very sometimes very narrow specific signal but but pretty good one so I'm I'm a big fan of uh, all of this because not only are we getting uh, just data but the natural interaction of people with that information is creating metadata the fact that you like something is mm -hmm. is pure magic for Facebook. Right, uh, and and if it's if the I, ultimate gesture data point, isn't you know, it? Because you're saying I endorse right. this. Right. I, I can like, you, tell you me you more. Say I know, but also, you're almost giving, you know, through what you like, you're almost classifying the information for Facebook. Right? They could show you a stream of inf of, of video where, in itself, you would need hours on end to be able to understand the meaning of the video. But it's four or five people that have a similar profile on, on their interest, like that piece of video. Suddenly, you're creating metadata around that video. And now, you know, the guy on the receiving end of like now has a piece of classification. Once you start having the metadata, you know, you're halfway yeah. there to, to extracting your, your, your true insight. So the volume is about flow, size of information. Right. Um, there's also velocity, right? We're talking about real time yep. in, in context of that. Um, creates a lot of noise, right? So, so L lots of noise. Uh, you you, you got to get analytics. You got to get all this together. You talked about the the contact movie out there for the folks. Yeah, uh, the younger audience might not remember, but there was a movie called Contact with Jodie Foster in there. Um, share that story with with us. Yeah, I thought that, that was a that, good good metaphor. Yeah, it's a it's a great metaphor. The beginning of contact there. You know, there is a, a an observation post somewhere in an island listening to, you know, the no the white noise of space. And there's, uh, you know, suddenly there's a gentleman who happens to have extra natural power because he's blind, so he has a better hearing than somebody else that hears a pattern inside that white noise. And they start drilling down that pattern and they realize, you know, that pattern is really a recording that was done in 1940 or something like that of Hitler and, you know. But that doesn't matter what, what it was. What was he interesting in, he decoded is that something this that guy was encoded the white noise, right? He, he latched on something very specific and was able to really pull true information out of this. I, I found that analogy, you know, very akin to what an enterprise is going to have to do, or even a consumer for that matter, right? Um, but an enterprise is going to have to do uh, to, to start extracting. Um, and this ties into your point earlier about how the social data, unstructured and as diverse and omnidirectional as it, as it comes in, you can, you said, latch onto things that look narrow. This is that kind of example where it looks like a very small, maybe small piece of data, but when you unpack it, it provides huge value. Exactly. That's kind of what exactly. you, were, you were getting and, at there. And, and every piece of context associated with that data, who's who's listening to it, when they're listening to it, uh, what, is, what is their interest and all that. This all creates metadata. So this comes back down to your whole point earlier about from the role of storage and compute, where most analytics have been looking in the rearview mirror at reporting. Right. That's time shifted. When you get into real time, it's really predictive. So the insight results aspect of this new value chain is going to come from these new data sources and the ability to act on them. It act on it and act on it quickly. Yeah, and, uh, and therefore, in the store compute, you don't want to, let's take tweet as an example, yeah. just an example, uh, you, know, you don't want to accumulate massive amount of tweet you know, all day and then at 8 p.m. send it for analysis to figure out what people are thinking about your product. You really want, as you're capturing all those tweets, you want to compute right there, yeah, right? Yeah. You don't want to move. Yeah. Well, you know what we're working on, so uh, yeah. you know, don't, don't <laughs> want to give too much detail out to the audience out there. No, but seriously, I mean, you're working on some pretty cool tech. I mean, this is not like, you know, um, I can get a computer science degree and start doing this. You've got to have some serious technology to get at this kind of level. What's your advice to folks out there, um, both on the, I want to get expand my career in this area from a tech perspective and also from a customer perspective. How do they jump in? What are you? What would you share with them? You've been in the information infrastructure side of the business for a long time. Um, what's your advice to the person who wants to advance their career 
either you know heavy duty computer science dude or you know some data scientists uh, to an enterprise how do i get started what's the first couple well steps? so if you don't know what to major in right uh, i'll i'll you know, <laughs> preach for my own church i said you know get a major in cs you're fine right yeah. but you can get a major in math because you're also fine yeah. right and and in fact you're going to be very complimentary yeah and if you get a dual degree math and computer science um, that's the whole Then they grail. can have your job or my job. <laughs> they got to be good on camera. No, they don't have to be to get my job. <laughs> um, well, um, no, but seriously, there's a lot of people so, out there who are, you know, this new data scientist role is interesting, but it's not the pure, it's more the math jock, not so much the programmer where you have convergence. You mentioned storage and compute kind of coming together. There's kind of collision between disciplines now, right? I mean, well, so the, the math geek uh, is, is really going to uh, figure out the formula. Right, that that makes the magic. Uh, generally, they have no clue how to implement the formula, uh, you know, and and make it efficient. Right, and that's where the CS guys are coming in. So that's why I said those two guys are good and they're fairly complementary. Now, if you're a business guy, um, if you know, you, be um, very aware of your business process, and and educate yourself on what are the tuning point of your business, so you can translate how you can optimize your business to the math gig and, and to the computer science gig. So then they can, they can do the magic behind the scene. There's a whole slew of new jobs, I think, are going to be created around information. Um, the notion of information architect uh, is going to be more popular than ever. Um, there's also... Now, that was a role in the past around data warehousing, right? There, and there was in data warehouse, but again, it was old. really... It was kind of old school, right? Uh, and it was all about library and kind of thing, <laughs> you putting know? data in boxes, yeah. creating schemas and all yeah. this. But like you, you're not in a world where you have to create schema. You have to learn to be extremely loose. Right? So one's a librarian. I would just simplify it and say librarian like role to much more strategic math, technical, you know, solution architect kind of thing. Right. Right. Get a solution get around around the information. The other one is the one of information steward. Um, there's. You know, d don't get me wrong, that we're not going to lose some of the right discipline and on how to manage your information. And there is an aspect of governance that is important. So that's an another business, another job that's going to be created, the one of information steward. Uh, people that care for information on behalf of somebody, they don't own it, but they care for that information on, on, on behalf and focus on data quality. Hey, we're John Luke Shetlane, the, uh, the EVP at Data Direct Networks. I'm John Furrier at SiliconAngle.tv, SiliconAngle.com. Uh, thanks for coming into the Cube today. Um, final question I wanted to just drill on to is talk about you know Data Direct Networks. You mentioned there's a lab in Mountain View, California. Right. Um, what are some of the cool things you're working on? I mean, you guys obviously have uh, uh, built a great sustainable business, self-funded, which is you know kind of the you're in the kind of the, what I call the Hall of Fame category as a company, in the sense that you've gone pretty much funded by the founders. Um, and have grown so big and have such a massive growth strategy ahead of you. I mean, looking really good, and the market's hot. Um, but you got to have some tech. And uh, you got to have some more tech we coming. Have, we, we have lots of tech. So, so, so talk about what's what, what are the coolest things you're working on to some of the more practical things that's going to get you guys to a billion dollars in revenue. Right. So more, you know, let's go on the practical stuff. You know, we we got to keep on doing what we're doing. Uh, we're going to do it faster, better and with more quality than anybody else on the planet, right? This is the block and tackling. Uh, we're good at what we do, which has got to be always good at what we do, right? Um, on, the, on the new stuff we do, it's massive investment in software, right? Um, but we're just opening, we're enlarging our office here in, Mon in Mountain View, moving a few, a few miles away. Um, we're hiring like crazy. Uh, we've got two other labs, one in uh, Colorado, a lot of our um, RAID uh, operating system is being done, and then another lab in, um, in Columbia, Maryland. Uh, we are hiring everywhere. Um, in fact, I tweeted last week, I can't keep up with the, with the job yeah. page on, on DDN slash career because of, you know, of our growth. It's a good problem to have, trust me. Yeah, right? yeah. Especially in that But economy. why would someone want to go work there? I mean, I'm, I'm asking because that question. Because what we're going to be doing I mean, is you gotta, you gotta really attract some edge. talent. And you it's, gotta, it's you got Google, edge. Facebook, you got all these guys, you know, yeah, you we do cool with stuff. That. We do cool stuff. Um, Can you give a little we're tease? We're still a startup. Uh, we we do a lot of work on, uh, for example, you know, key value stores. We do a lot of work on you know, new object file system. We do 
a lot of cool stuff on the cloud. Um, you know, we, we have a whole team of 10 people that it's, you know, in the process of releasing version two of a cloud builder, uh, which is got to be very sexy. What's the most exciting true. thing that you see that you see in the future coming around the corner that other people might not see? In other words, um, that gets you excited um, in terms of a trend. Is it cloud? Anyone can build a cloud. Is it more techy? Peek around the corner and share your vision with what you, what's really exciting you. Well, I, as I said, you know, what, what excites me, me is the size of the opportunity. I, you know, everywhere I look, there is not a place where I say, this, this is going to be a dud. This is not going to last, and we, we better move on. Right? Um, you know, I, I can peek every in, into every single one of the market we play, whether it's governance, whether it's rich media, whether it's cloud. Um, it just doesn't stop. Right? And in fact, believe it or not, I mean, all growth is limited by the number of people we can put on the street knocking on doors. Right, and we can sustain 30% growth for a long, long time if only we could get the people. Um, but if I look around the corner, I'm really excited with the uh, all the virtualization work we do around virtualization compute inside the right array, where we're really you know I, you know, not to harp about it, but I spoke about function shipping. I want to enable that function shipping. I want it to make it trivial for somebody to take the algorithm uh, and and you know, almost transparently distribute some of that work, you know, to be done in, in our devices. That, that, that's a cool part of it. Um, and then uh, around the cloud, the uh, interesting opportunity of leveraging all those technologies I talked about to focus on hybrid cloud for specific industry. Because if I can, through what we're building and how we're building it, facilitate, reduce the TCO, for users in a given industry to do their job, that's exciting, you know. And, you know, I, it doesn't have to be a public cloud, it could be an industry-based cloud, it could be a private cloud for somebody, uh, you know, in, 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 in their business. But just like, um, as you were mentioning, you can slide your credit card on Amazon and, and get some store and get some compute. Um, I think we're going to be able to, if we have a credit card for a given industry, we're going to be able to slide that credit card you know, in that specialized cloud for that industry and get stuff done that we expect to be done there, right? what, whatever that industry is. I mean, it's an exciting time, and i got to say I'm pretty, um, I get intoxicated by the new opportunities that are emerging. I mean, we're in the publishing business. We have SiliconAngle.tv, SiliconAngle.com on the publishing and video side. Obviously, we see the video thing, you know, challenges all the time, and the greatness of video yeah i think it can um, help you with your video <laughs> trying to get you some get us some drives we need some drives uh no but i mean i honestly see business opportunities for guys like us as well to say you know i could actually expand we're self-funded kind of like you guys in the old days 10 years ago 20 years ago akamai was leveraged up with huge amounts of capital i could literally roll out a video cdn content delivery network for very little capital that's true compared to what it right. was, you know. Talk about that dynamic. I mean, that's not yeah, that's, that's not that's trivial to do, but now you can do it. It's yeah, what Amazon can, was for storage. Right, you, you can do that for content. Let me give you an example. So one of the big things we hear about cloud is that um, it's so easy to do. And, you know, for startups like us, oh, yeah, you can develop in the cloud, low startup cost, get validation, and then and ship that product. And, and the enterprise side, it was you put your credit card down, and you can put tests and ops in the cloud. The, but the CIOs were rejecting that because they didn't want to put their critical apps into the cloud. All right. What you guys are essentially are talking about is with software, I can put the entire function production into the cloud. Yeah. That's I, what private cloud dream is. That's, so that's where, are we, where, where are we with that and what's your angle on that? Well, uh, so that's really what the private cloud is, is to be able to offer the same level of uh, SLA and QoS and sometimes security, although there's too much fear around public cloud security that's not justified, but I, I understand why some industry have a heightened sense of, of security. Um, it's fairly easy to do now because you can really um, find out there, uh, we provide some, other people provide some, some building block appliances that are already have packaged, all that is necessary to build your cloud, and you can do it almost just in time. You don't have to buy some giant infrastructure on day one and, and wait till you have 99 users to start buying another giant yeah, yeah. infrastructure for 101 user. You can start really s 
small, right? And as the demand pans up, right? Like in your case, the demand of people watching silicon.tv, you can just add new boxes, you know, whether they're software or hardware appliance, doesn't matter. I, I use an, uh, uh, a metaphor for boxes to, to just grow your cloud. There's a lot of stuff that. But for the enterprise, they want to have that same effect where but how someone can put their credit card down and get Amazon S3, yeah, for example. Right. And, and but there's some there's a glass ceiling there with Amazon. I mean, there's a, you know, you can do it up to a certain point, and then it's like, wow, it gets complex, configuration management, automation, SLAs. You know, the list kind of goes on and on that once you hit a certain tipping point in Amazon, it's over the top. It's, expensive and, it's, it's, it's pain and complex and right. risky. But the, the thing with, um, you know, with any... Um, cloud solution, especially involving storage, because storage has a really high cost of TCO, right? There's, there's, as I was saying, the $1 you spend in storage, the asset, is really $8 you're spending in real money. And it doesn't always um, uh, scale with, uh, with a, you know, the capacity. So there is, um, when you are a service provider in the world of storage, there's kind of a point as to which you no longer um, have an economy of scale for the customers. You have an economy of scale for you, but it becomes really too expensive for the customers. And that's a good experience point where, um, as an enterprise, you may think, hey, I'm going to run my own storage, uh, m my own cloud, basically, in my walls, in my data center, because then my asset cost... Uh, even with a TCO, uh, even if I include the TCO, it's still going to be less than what, what I could pay for. That's a big, I mean, that's a good point. TCO, total cost of ownership, is a big yeah. issue. And a lot of people don't buy with TCO in mind. Right? It's always after the fact. Yeah, it's always after the It's the, the classic fact. shark fin, you know. It's like you see a fin, you don't know what's under the water. What's you know? under the water, right. You know, there's the extra costs. Okay, we're here with Jean-Luc uh, Chetlien, the uh, EVP at Data Direct Networks. Final parting comment, uh, just share with us the vision in your mind for the next five to 10 years. Not from a DDN perspective, but you know, taking about all your experience as a startup entrepreneur, uh, executive, tech geek, uh, what's gonna be different in our world five to 10 years from now? Um, our life, how technology <laughs> and storage and all well, this stuff, all this stuff's data is gonna drive that. What's gonna be different? I think that um, number one, the opportunity are limitless. Is, there's, there's more opportunity to create startup now than there was ever, right? And it's all because of that information being the currency, that information being, um, as my former boss at HP used to say, it's, it's a natural resource right? we, we, we can all tap on, right? So think of massive amount of oil flowing and we all can play with that, we all can do something with that oil, we all will get very successful and wealthy doing that. We can do the same with information, right? So all life in the five, 10 years will be completely driven by um, how that information is being used. And what's interesting is that today we are looking for information and looking for insight, but 10 years from now, the information will find us and the insight will find us. So it's no longer, you know, the, the, the Google model, God bless Google, I, you know, they're a great platform, I use them every day, right? But you gotta look for something, right? What's gonna happen going forward? <laughs> we just had this conversation with, with Black O CEO, Rich Grenta. Computer science should be working for us. Exactly. Like the Star what's Trek magic happen, needs to come back. It, it, what's going to happen is that information will find us well, find us in the, con in the context that we are. You know, I expect that not that far from now, you'll be landing in Moscow. You'll be taking money out of an ATM machine. And along with the, you know, the receipt for the, the ruble that you took, right, will be a map to the nearest McDonald's, for example, because information knows that you're a McDonald's lover, and that's what you want when you land in the foreign countries <laughs> go eat a McDonald's. So that's a case where information find the user, and that's what makes a big, big difference. You know, we, we, in fact, we see it today, even on some GPS system. You buy a GPS system, and as you're you know, going to point, there's a little icon that shows up saying there's a Starbucks there, right? You did not look for Starbucks. You were just driving along looking at your GPS, uh, hopefully yeah. the road too, yeah. right? And you saw there was a Starbucks sign. You, you, you stop at the Starbucks and have a coffee, right? That is the beginning of information finding people. That's the future. 